All right, so um, welcome. Uh, I'm here to talk uh, about the topic of, of reducing classroom stress um, using some of the technologies that we actually have available to us, right? Here at, at Stony Brook, um, <clears throat> there are a, a number of tools that are, that are already available to us, um, and you know, th this is sort of an effort to make it a little bit less intimidating to, to actually take advantage of some of these tools. So if you don't have to do the experimentation, I can sort of share with you my experiences instead, as well as some of the rationale behind it. Um, so first of all, who am I? I'm a professor here over at, um, at, at SUNY, SUNY Korea, and uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Technology and Society. Formerly, I have been professionally a, um, a software developer, and I've also been a professional instructional designer, so designing and developing these materials for, for corporate clients. Um, did that for a, roughly a decade, and um, and then my research is on um, is, is focused on collaborative learning, right? So um, and, and specifically when collaborative learning goes wrong, right? So I, there, there's a, a platform and um, and an informational website. Um, if you guys are interested in that, I've already done some discussion about that. It's evolved. I'll probably do another discussion at another time, um, but at the moment that's that's sort of what's what's important. Um, the way that I'd like to conduct this talk is is sort of interactive, so I certainly have a lot to say, and, and those of you who know me know I'm not shy about really talking forever, but it's generally more interesting for me as well if you guys are interactive, right? If you if you ask questions when you have questions, so, um, so don't hesitate to, to ask. All right, um, so my, my goals today are to, to sort of introduce some of the technologies that are available to us here at SUNY Korea. And, um, and specifically, the, the Stony Brook uh, sections here at SUNY Korea. And, and we'll understand why shortly. And, um, and then to talk a little bit about how they can potentially help us in the classroom and, um, and, and then how to actually use them. So my, my goal is to sort of introduce what's available then tell you why you might want to use them, and then show you how, right? Hopefully I've, I've interested you enough at that point. Um, how am I gonna do it? Not necessarily in this order, but these are the, the, the main topics, right? I'm gonna introduce a few platforms. Um, we're gonna discuss the, the stress points for, for, for students and for instructors that they aim to address, or, or that they can be used potentially to address. Then I'll give a, um, a brief demonstration of how they can be used, and, um, and then I will address comments and, and questions. And, and comments and questions are welcome throughout. So first of all, what, what is it good at? You know, what, what can we actually do with it? Right? What, what's available and, and what, can we, um, what is technology good for? Well, one is for counting stuff, right? Computers are really good at sort of the tedious work that we mess up on because we get bored, right? So, so it's certainly my goal to let the computer do the things that it's good at, and that frees me up to do the things that I'm actually good at, right? So providing information to students, right? We've all had students, or maybe we are students, that have asked questions. Maybe we've asked the same questions over again because we didn't catch it the first time. And maybe we've even been afraid to ask a question because we thought maybe that's a stupid question. Or maybe your instructor is irritated today. Or maybe your instructor didn't have lunch today. Or maybe your instructor has just answered the same question five times. You didn't quite understand what they were saying, but now you're afraid to ask, right? So um, all of these things, a, a machine is really good at not caring about any of that frustration stuff, right? That makes it an optimal solution for addressing this. And it also makes the instructor and the student happier, right? Um, it's also really good at following rules. In fact, it's terrible at not following rules, right? It will do exactly what you tell it, and it will not do anything more or less. It'll do exactly what you tell it. Obvious caveat there is you have to know what you're telling it to do, right? But, um, but with all of this in mind, let's begin with one technology. We have 
here at, um, at Stony Brook, we have a subscription to uh, Google Apps for Education, which gives us things like Google Drive, Google Sites, and I think a, a whole bunch of other technologies as well. You, you, I think there are also um, uh, YouTube accounts attached to it, basically the entire Google suite. Um, we, we all wind up with these Google accounts which give us access to all of these materials. Now granted, all of these materials are basically available for free for personal <coughs> use anyway, but this gives us sort of a walled garden within which we can work on these things, right? And, and it, this offers us some benefits in terms of sharing. We'll see that in a moment. So this is an example of one of my course sites, right? Um, some of the pieces that I'll, I'll draw your attention to, um, and, and again, if you've been in, in one of my classes, you'll, 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 you're familiar with this. If you've been in two of my classes, you're bored of this, right? Because this is the same thing that I use for every single class, the same basic structure. You're always going to have sort of some random theme or, or, or some theme that I, I felt was somehow um, valuable, Google has already vetted these as, I guess, non-offensive or, or whatever. You can customize it, but you don't have to. If you don't feel like it, just go with something that's available and you can easily vary them so that you give a, a slightly unique look and feel so that way you don't accidentally make a change to the wrong site. But the, the nice thing about it is that it it provides consistency, right? And then, all of my sites, they always start off with the, the basic information, which gives my name, um, my, if there's a TA for this site, it gives that information, all of this in a nice little table, consistently formatted, it'll work on your mobile device, it will work really pretty much anywhere. Now, Google has also put together um, a, an updated version of sites, which, has a, a different look and feel, different capabilities, and it is optimized for um, easily translating between uh, mobile sites and desktop sites. I've played around with it. I like this classic version better. It, it gives more of a structure. It's a little bit less friendly on the, um, on the mobile side, but, um, but one of the things that I really like about it is sort of this ease of creating a, a left nav. And the left nav offers us basically a table of contents. Because I look at this as my syllabus. The benefit to it though is that it can be dynamic, right? I can keep adding my, present, my presentation slide decks to it as the semester goes on. I'll, I'll show you, I'll walk you through one of the actual sites in a moment, but here, and again, you'll see this in a moment, you've got a home section, right? That's this page right here. I've got a little calendar over on the side. Below that, you're gonna see that I have a calendar in a different format. That's manual and kind of tedious to build, but I feel that it offers significant value for, for my students, and that way they don't have to um, keep going to this calendar and, and back and forth, because this one's not as friendly. We'll, again, we'll see that in a moment. But then I've got an assignment section, and it's got all these little sub-menus, which allows you to sort of see all of the assignments at a glance, and then you can go into the detail. But you're not overwhelmed by the detail. You only have to see it when you feel like actually seeing it, right? Um, it also allows me to correct my mistakes throughout the year. So instead of having a paper syllabus, and, and I don't use paper syllabi at all, I, I tell my students that if they feel like it, they can go through the pages of my site and print it out, but I, I would be surprised if any of them have actually done that, right? Partly because this is live, and I'm constantly updating it throughout the semester, and I have tools on here that students can use, and it's a lot more dynamic than the paper that often just gets recycled right after class. So then, as I mentioned, there's, a, there's also a resources section, right? Um, we, we've got our sort of our, our weekly resources. Um, this sitemap thing, it just builds in there and provides it for you, but quite frankly, this effectively is the sitemap for this. Um, and so, so the things that I like to, and I'll, I'll show you, but um, the things that I like to include are, are calendar, um, grading parameters, links 
to, to digital resources and, and in the slide decks themselves. And I even make available my attendance sheets. We'll see those in just a moment. And, um, and then there's a nice little tool for student presentations, which I'll also show you. So, if we click on this and, and everybody, I, I can make the, uh, the slide deck available. All of these things are sort of hyperlinked right within the slide deck, so you can click on it and pull up the materials immediately, right? like I just did. So this is the actual site. Now you'll notice one of the things that I really like is having this calendar item over here on the, on the right-hand side. right? This is a live Google Calendar. I am a big dork, right? I am incredibly calendar driven. I love to do lists, right? And I encourage my students to be organized in similar fashion. I do that by creating these calendars that they can then subscribe to. So that all they have to do, by my embedding this on the screen, all they have to do is click this little add button. And they can do it on their phone too, right? They can click this add button and it will add this to their Google Calendar. So that, that way, they never have to ask me, when is this due? When is that due? All of that information is right here in the calendar itself and they can check it themselves. And so my answer to them generally is check the calendar. And actually there's, a mo there's, there's more of a reason for that. I make a lot of mistakes. I'm not perfect. I might have studied for a long time, but my memory is not that good. And especially for things like numbers and dates, I make a lot of mistakes. This way, I don't have to make the mistakes. And I don't have to worry about, oh, but you said this in class. I say, don't ever trust any dates that I put out in class. This is the information. It's right here. I'm giving it to you. You don't have to remember it. It's there, and it's available on demand. The other thing that's particularly valuable, you know, you, you get this nice little course description, but then there's also, um, you know, we can put in here whatever material we want. And one of the things that I think is particularly important is to have your objectives listed right there on the front page so people can constantly come back to it and see, well, why am I actually in this class? Right? Now, this goes more into sort of instructional design and trying to make sure that you're communicating transparently to the, to the students. I try to highlight this on the front page so that people really know what it is that they're walking into. And then, as I said before, I also have this sort of calendar at a glance, which has all of the assignments. Now, I don't 100% recommend doing this. It is really helpful. I, I think it's really helpful for the students. Um, and, and we have some students, and they can tell me whether or not they think it's helpful. It takes a lot of time to actually build this out. And it also takes a lot of time to maintain it. So if you change an assignment or you move something around, not only do you have to change it here, but you also have to change it in the calendar. I think it's worth it, but I wouldn't recommend that everybody else take that on. Um, but, um, and, and, and this is, yeah. Well, finish your thought off. Well, and, and the other thing about this is that this is just a simple Google spreadsheet, right? And so I can go ahead and, and create one of these. I create one of these for every single um, course that I build. And then I always have this document in that folder. Again, that's something that I'll show you in a, in a moment, but I always have one of these documents in that folder. The difficult part is, as I said, maintaining synchronization with the calendar, because I, I haven't come up with a good way of generating one off of the other, so they get out of sync. If I make a change to one and I forget to make, you know, I mean, sometimes, as I said, I make mistakes. If I forgot something and I have to add something later on, the, you know, I, I have certainly run into problems where you, know, you get the calendar out of sync. Did you have a question? Um, listening answer the question, I was gonna ask, how did you sync the calendar with the, Manually. then you answered, <clears throat> excuse me, it was in a spreadsheet. Yeah. Can you design something in the calendar and then share the calendar, and that would be one way of? Absolutely, so, so, this, <laughs> is, so this is the best way mm -hmm. of sort of automatically sharing that calendar. I am sure that I could write something, given enough time. Um, 
that would pull this information out and write it into a spreadsheet and sort of make sure that that's always up to date so that I would only have to change it in one place. Um, I have, right? It would, it would take time to actually write that. There might even that be a very people, convenient thing. To yeah, and there, there might even be such tools available. Mm -hmm. But this, one of the other things that's important about the things that I'm presenting to you guys today is that this is stuff that's all available right now, today, without any sort of extras or add-ons. This is all just right here. When you go, when you come up into one of these sites, if you are the creator or the owner or you have right privileges, then you'll see this little edit page icon. And you can come in here and then you see this alternate view. This is a, a WYSIWYG editor. What you see is what you get. So if I make a change, that change is exactly what it's gonna look like. Except with respect to these sorts of elements. This element is dynamic, this is a calendar. If I wanted to add something else in here, I could totally do that. If I go over to the insert button, I can add stuff from a, a Google group if you're using something like that. If, you're, um, if you, there's a YouTube video, you could just embed a YouTube video directly in there, right? Um, this is for you know, various gadgets that you have available. You know, the, the, the things that are sort of built right into, um, uh, right, built right into Google Sites. And um, you can have it build for you a table of contents, right? A lot of different options. And the table of contents would maintain itself as sort of updated, right? So you can sort of hop around on things. You might use that as your main page. I, I, I prefer to have this sort of custom main page. You also have so, so we know that this is one of those Google Calendar items. If you click on the item, this is one of those gadgets or one of those embedded objects, then there's a little properties item, right? This little gear icon is standard throughout the, the site. And if you click on the properties, then you can set all sorts of, fun, you know, all sorts of different uh, elements of it. You can have it add a different calendar, or, or dis sorry, display a different calendar, if that's what you chose. Um, you can set the view, you can have it be in, in week view. I like agenda view, I find that it's the most helpful for this particular um, version. I mean, I, I don't see why I would want just a week, right? Um, and it will also mean, and you can also set the time zone, right, all sorts of things. I encourage you to play with it. And, and if, I, if you make a change and then save it, it will automatically be reflected as soon as you save it. Is there a way of telling students which version that they're currently talking about? What I tend to do, I don't use a website, but I use an ongoing updated Microsoft Word file that I put on a website, and I share it with them when I update it. Because there's always like a V1, V2, so I, they always know to look for the most recent number in the file system. So that's the way I, I make a note that something has changed. Even if they don't hear about it, they can at least, fair warning that there has been small change that they should consult their email about? So, I believe the most, that's a good question. Um, I believe that this does have a version history. Most, maybe it does not. Oh yeah, revision history. Okay. So, so you could actually create one of these sites and then you can actually, and, and I believe that it's even possible, it, at, at least it is in some, like in all the Google Docs, right. types of Docs, mm -hmm. you can actually name a version for sort of what you've done, right? And what is special about that particular version. And that's available to both you as the designer as well as all people viewing it? I'm not positive. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I really, I'm not sure about that. Um, so so I, I've never had the need to, to go back and, and actually make those changes. Um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll highlight something if I've made a change. Um, I'll, I'll highlight it in red, but I find that that's usually messy and so I, I usually don't. One kind of workaround, I, I put the V1 at the very top of it, yep. but I also, after I do the like, syllabus of 372, you know, low resolution, V3, then I put in the title itself exactly what it changed, the little note I can put in the file itself, so when they click on the file, they have yeah. to read that. But that's so, one way of forcing people to look at the dynamics of what is actually changed. So from that perspective, some of the things that I've done it, when using docs yeah. is, um, it, for versioning, I've usually gone with um, putting a date, appending the date at the end, so 2018, or you know, yeah. you know, 
year, month, day, so that way people will always know, because again, it is very sortable right. if they continue to do it that way. But then the other nice thing about, the, the other thing that I, I do is I'll use track changes, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of track changes. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the main page. Then, on all of my pages, I've got some stuff which, it, or, or on all of my syllabi, I've got some stuff which is pretty much boilerplate, right? Like this, the advisory section. And I just copy it over from one class to the next. I, I'm able to actually make a copy of the entire site, which is, which is very nice. So something like this is, is just replicated from one, one course to the next. Then I've got my assignment section. And in the assignments, again, I'm using a spreadsheet. And this shows the point values of all of the assignments. And it gives you sort of an, an overview and some recommendations. Again, another pointer to the advisories. And then you can click on each of the items and it'll give you a description of the assignment itself. I, I like to provide this because it, it gives you some guidance as to what it is. Now, I try to keep these generally as minimal as possible. And I'll show you why later on. Right? But there's a, a deliberate reason for it. This is a, an overview of what I'm looking for. It is not sort of the detailed guidelines for the assignment. These are not the instructions for completing the assignment. I provide that in an alternate fashion, which we will get to shortly. Question? Are the students listed for um, classes? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the problem I'm trying yeah. to address. Yeah. 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 And I felt like if the rubric itself, the point guidelines and the explanation is identical in that site and yeah. in Blackboard, that would make it even so much easier for you. Yeah. And yeah, and, 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 and in fairness, that's the goal. So one of the things that I've done more recently is in the rubric itself, I will say refer to the syllabus. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I should be going in the other direction. Yeah. But but yeah. Mm -hmm. Um it, it, it might make sense to um, remove this section altogether and just leave it with the assignment sheets. I'll explain. So, so Lyle is talking about um, the way that I use rubrics and, um, and how those integrate with the assignments. We're going to talk about that. There's going to be a, a section on that coming up. So you'll understand more about what she's commenting on, but it, 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 it goes very much in line with my sort of philosophy on, um, on, on transparency. Oh yeah, from a more like sentiment, like emotional point of view, when you look at the rubric and then look at the like, and then do the link, follow the, mm -hmm. follow the, the love line. Yeah. That it's like overwhelming. Yeah. It's like there are a lot of block of words, and then you have to refer to it. Yeah. And then I have to compare it and see. So. Right. And that's one thing. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I totally, I, I get what you're saying, and I appreciate that, and, and this is sort of a work in progress. Um, as you know, last semester, it was slightly different from the right. way that it is now this semester. Not that it's expensive, yeah, it, I, I'm trying to, to move more in that direction, right. but yeah. And, and, and also, the amount of, of text that's here right. is shrinking significantly yeah. each time. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, one of the other things that's nice about this, because it's basically a word processor, is that I can just sort of, I, I wind up sketching out my, my content and then filling the stuff in, um, which is nice. It just, it, it works well and it helps me to organize what's actually going on in the course. Then I've got a resources section. And in the resources section, I sometimes, in most courses, I separate this out in terms of resources and then weekly resources. So perhaps the naming could be better, but resources are sort of general resources that are needed. Potentially these are readings, potentially these are FAQs or materials to support particular assignments. But this is what's called, if you go into the 
page settings, mm, sorry, yeah, yeah. If you go into the page settings, it's currently using the template called a file cabinet, right? And that gives you this block down here. And you can put, throw links or files, whatever you'd like, right? If I want to add something to the site, I can click add from drive and find any of the items that I actually have in my drive anywhere. Or I can add a link, right? By putting in the URL and giving it a name. Or I can do add file and just directly upload a file. Now, I strongly recommend putting all of your materials, copying all of your materials into Drive. When you do, when you do this sort of add file, then sometimes it's difficult to find that file again. I like to keep everything consolidated. And again, I'll show you how I do that in just a moment. But, uh, but here are some of the resources that my 371 course uh, students are using over the course of this semester. And you can do all sorts of categorizations as well, right? Um, if I wanted to move this item, which is a link, into a folder, right? You see these, this FAQs folder, um, or you could create a new folder. And, and it will just sort of create one of those little folder items on here, which is very nice for organization. It also means that I can then close these if I feel like it, right? The student has the, the ability to open them up again, but it just makes things a little bit less overwhelming. Then, when we go to the weekly materials folder, then you'll notice that I have, and, and, and again, using OA 29, right? August 29th, 2017, right? So using a date as the, um, as the sorting criteria, or, or as the naming convention, so that, that way it automatically sorts based upon that. These are my presentations from the entire semester. So all of my students can go back in here at any point during the semester and refresh their memory on what, they, uh, on, on what I was talking about. Now my slide decks tend to be thin, right? It tends to be more me talking and, and discussing with the, hopefully discussing, oftentimes more me talking, but when you get some, some good students in the class, then, uh, then, then you get some real conversation going, right? When you get people actually engaged, which you know, is, is, is our role as the instructor, right? But they can go in here and say, okay, well, well, what was this thing about data science? Let me open that one up. They can pull the whole slide deck up and walk through the entire class. Now, one of the things you have to be aware of with that is you need to make sure that sharing is turned on. Okay, and that's, that's one of the things that trips me up a lot of the time, is I'll forget to share. And, and then I get a whole bunch of little emails coming in from, uh, from Google Drive saying, hey, so-and-so is requesting access, which is fine. I, and then I go ahead and I... And which is actually good that Google has that feature too. Exactly, yeah. So it, it does allow them to request access. And I tell everybody in the beginning of the semester, the class is there for you, right? I'm providing these materials for you. If I haven't provided it, it's not that I don't want to, it's that I forgot, I made a mistake, right? Um, and then I also have some other resources here. Uh, a bingo template for one of my activities, um, mm -hmm. an example team contract, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and, um, and then some other materials as well. First thing I'm gonna look at, or, or the next thing that we're gonna look at is actually not this way. Attendance sheets, okay? So I take attendance in the beginning of class. Um, I, I don't actually, uh, I, I take a, a different approach potentially to, um, to attendance than other people do but I take attendance myself. I don't have my TA do it in front of class. I do it in the beginning of class because it takes a little bit of time in the very beginning, but it means that I actually know people's names, right? Which, quite frankly, I think makes a difference, right? Um, I, I mean, it, it, it helps to actually engage with, um, with your students in the classroom, right? I didn't know I was enrolled in your class. I'm sorry. I enrolled. <laughs> You're enrolled in this class. Okay. Yeah. And apparently there's a whole bunch of people missing. Um, <laughs> but, but one of the nice things here is, as you'll notice, 
there's this absences piece here. What's that all about? Well, first of all, let me show you the dates. It seems like it would be really annoying to, to actually enter all of these dates in and notice that I'm actually going through and I am simply doing, I put in the first date and then I just add them in, right? I add in, um, so this is the Tuesday, this is the Thursday, and then I do plus seven, plus seven, and then I stretch that all the way along, and then I wind up getting all of the dates in between. Say right? that again, I lost the thing. Sure. That's what I want to know, okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so spreadsheets will do date math for you, Okay. right? And that means that I can put in 829, yeah. and then 829, which is D, plus two, or D1 plus two, gives me 831. So it's code is D, you type in D in the bar at the top. Yeah, D, well this is the code, it's D, yeah, D1 plus two. I see, okay. Okay, and then if I go to the next one, I can do D1 plus seven. And then after that, I just keep going um, E1 plus seven, F1 plus seven, but, but once I have this in here, mm -hmm. then I can grab this, yeah. and it's smart enough. To know that you're copying two different kind of functions across. Exactly. Huh. And it will just go ahead and, and stretch that I right on. Okay, so it, it will actually, so that way you don't have to go in there and, and you don't have to care what the dates are. That's really the nice thing about it. But another thing that I've done here, is I'm using, first of all, I'm using a little lookup table here in order to force me to, well, in order to give me the drop downs, but then in order, in order to force P for present, A for absent, E for excused, and L for late. You can do it however you want. It doesn't matter, right? But the important thing is that that's sort of constrained by what's in here, and you can modify this. But going back here, then I come in here and I say, if, it's A, then I add 0.5, right? I go through this entire list and I say, if it's, every time I see an A, then I add a 0.5. Every time I see an L, I'm sorry, every time I see an A, add one, and every time I see an L, add a 0.5. So A for absence, and, and my, my feeling is that an absence counts as half the day. You could totally change this to be 0.3 if you wanted to. It's really entirely up to you. But then if I come in here and I say, oh, well, Mark was not here that day. You'll notice this number one goes up, right? And then Mark is constantly tardy, right? So now I give him a, a 1.5 absence. And if, if I wanted to, as I said, I could switch this very easily to 0.3. And then I have another absence and another late. And that way, it's keeping track of how far it is. Now the other thing about this is, this isn't just my information, right? This is information that everybody should know because they were in class or they weren't in class. It doesn't have anything personal in here. I could certainly annotate it with why they were excused, but I don't do that, right? I have email for that. Which means I can make this publicly available. And it is. So when you open up, you know, you, you certainly don't want to um, invade the student's privacy, but everybody knows whether you were absent or you weren't, right? And so I can actually go through here and see um, what the absences actually look like. Can I interject something? Yes. I, we both come to similar ways of doing it. Um, I had one TA in one class and they take care of the attendance before I come in. And then I have another class of about 35 people where I don't have a TA for the first time. And so what I have done, I just, I, what I, I take a database like this, but instead of using letters, I, I old fashioned binary, one if they're there, yep. zero if they're not. Yeah. Plus I'm actually showing this to the entire class. So 
they're following me and verifying that they get it right. Some of them say, no, I'm really here, or yep. you put it in the wrong place. So yep. that everybody is definitely watching it. Yep. Sure I show it right on the screen. They're the police. Exactly. That I, I tell them they're all my TAs in this class. They and and yeah. if, they, if they see that there's a mistake, they, yeah. I tell them to send me an email, and I'll, right. up, I'll update it. Absolutely. Plus, but, when, it's, when it's already numbered, they also know that they're late. I will give them a point nine. If they're really late, point eight, and it goes down. So, and they yep, know. Could that. do, yep. So yep. I'm just saying, it's exactly the same thing. You do it through a formulae structure. But yep. I worked around the formulae, and I just showed them the numbers themselves and yep. what it means. But that's very, I like the color code. You see that yeah, and that's another thing is. Um, very easy for the blind or, you know. Exactly, and so in order to do. Yeah, so, so actually for this one, um, that's, a, that's what you call conditional formatting. Yeah. And you can just go in here, mm. and it gives you these rules. Mm. And you can just go through and, and update those rules however you want. And you right click to get conditional formatting? Yes. And I can do conditional formatting for text and letters? I mean, yeah, whatever you numbers. want. Okay, so can, if you add a new rule. I can rule, do a one and a zero with textual formatting. Yep. Yeah, okay. You can add a new rule so and color it, it gives you lots of different options. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yep. Very good. I like the color code so you can quickly see what's happening. Yeah. Another thing I do um, for every line, um, just serendipitously, I, I developed this, but the acronym I liked when I was copying things over from the Net ID zone for, for faculty, you can take and strip all of the names from the official roster. Uh -huh. and then I copied that into an Excel file. And when I did that, I thought, oh no, it's got an extra space between them. So I just kept it. But later I realized an extra space below every student is a great place to put notes that I'm going to forget, like why they're uh -huh. late, this person's excuse, so there's a yeah. space between each of them. And this way, I, yeah. I never had a way to add a note. So if every student gets two lines, and you, you always have a way at each block to make a little note that can be collapsed. One other thing that you might want to, yeah. to, to be aware of is if you right click here, uh -huh. you can actually do insert comment mm -hmm. on the cell itself. So that way you can say, um, Mark never comes to class because he thinks I Right? I don't think he smells. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because he knows I never shower. <laughs> right? Um, no, I'm sorry. No, no, so, so that's, that's a very, um, uh -huh. it, it's a nice tool, It'll, and it saves you a whole bunch of time afterwards, and provides that transparency mm -hmm. in the classroom so that people know exactly where they stand at right. what time. Then, I don't know how many of you guys like to use presentations in your classes, I'm sure that some people don't like to be having to give presentations in their classrooms, but one of the things that I do in, in a number of my classes is I have actually all of, or I have my students giving presentations every day. Some of my students are giving presentations every day, and um, it, they are not, they are not, in my case, presentations that they should be preparing for, but basically reporting on their current progress or reporting on something that they did over the course of the past week, depending on which class it's in. This allows students the opportunity to actually present and get used to speaking in front of people, which is very valuable, and increasingly so these days, right? Um, so for all of those reasons, I like having people present. But one of the difficulties is, how do you schedule it? How do you decide who speaks when? Right? Especially because the first person to speak is always going to be nervous. Am I doing it right? I don't have any kind of a template to work off of. And it's not fair. Why don't I, you know, get, you know, I, I should get some kind of um, benefit for, for having presented. And, oh, wait a second, I just presented three times in a row. All of this other stuff. Or I can't be here this week. You know, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why that's difficult and, and often feels unfair. Am I going to do it alphabetically? Is that, does that mean that just because, you know, Najong happened to have a parent that, you know, it, it was born at the top of the alphabet instead of the bottom, she's either always going to be last or first? Not so good. So I decided, and, and then the other thing is they yell at me, right? Because they get upset with me because I'm the one who makes the schedule. So what I've said now is instead of me making the schedule, let Google decide or let the spreadsheet decide. And what I've done here is very similar to the presentation uh, to the attendance sheet. You come in here and you say, "Okay, um, well, well, what numbers do we have in here? Great, that's that's fine. Or, or what people do we have in here? That's that's fine." Then I say, "Well, clearly I'm presenting, right?" 
So, well, sorry, when you open this up, it tells you a name down here, right? And that's my name. And I'm, I happen to be presenting, but this is actually luck of the draw. What's actually happening is more complex than necessary. But, um, so I've got this sort of complex formula here, right? And what it really is doing is it's looking at these numbers here. It finds the minimum number that's available in there, right? The minimum number right now is number one, right? And, it's, and it says all the ones that are a number one, right? Look at all of those, count those up, and if it's a number one, then you're sort of eligible, right? And then select one of those, use a random, where is it, random, times, that whole thing figures out how many people are available, okay? Now, that would potentially come up with a, a significant problem, right? Because after, so, so what happens is, I go ahead and I present, and I say, I presented, and that gives me a number two here, right? For every time I present, I get a point, or, or I get a mark here. So that would mean that the numbers here should at least, in theory, be sort of incorrect, right? So, sorry, it's not updating. Yeah, okay, so now it should be calculating incorrectly because of the way that Excel works, right? The easiest way to create this formula is to sort of assume that these are contiguous, right? That these are all the same number in a row, right? Or that they're, that they're sorted. And that way I can look at all of the ones all together. But right now, it's not really sorted. I know that this is really complex and, it, and you don't have to understand all of it, but the important part is that if I go through and I sort this, then it puts the people who have presented down at the bottom, and then it will only select from the ones in here. And now, Anthony is next. So then, Anthony presents on the second, and then I resort, and Susanna gets in there. And this makes sure that I don't have the same person presenting each time. And it also, because of that random number in there, it means that I'm not deciding specifically who's next. So people don't get upset with me. So I'm not stressed about having these presentations going on. And I think it's a little bit less stressful for the students. Yes, it's, it's stressful not knowing when you're gonna present. That's definitely the case. But the, the assignment is designed that way, right? Because you don't necessarily know when you're going to need to speak in front of somebody. But this way, it takes away the, oh, the instructor hates me, right? And I don't have to worry about that. It's just about who is presenting next. Did you want to say something? You don't blame the instructor, you just blame the computer system. Then that's don't fine, don't and that's fine, and I don't feel like you hate me, yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. So it, it alleviates a little bit of the stress in the classroom. By alleviating the stress of the instructor, that also helps in the classroom because it's noticeable. You know when I'm having a bad day, right? You know when I'm coming into the classroom and I, you know, my son did something last night or, or had a bad sleep last night and whatever. The more we can do to make our lives easier in the classroom, the better the experience is going to be for the student. So the one last thing that I'm going to, to talk about, because that's, that's me showing you most of the stuff with respect to Google Drive. Now I want to give you a brief summary because I'm running out of time. Oh, sorry, it, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to click here. So um, one of the things to, to know is if you go into the manage site piece, you can then go ahead and copy a site. So this is effectively the same site that I use for all of them, and it gives you this shell. Then you have to go in and update it for the new class, right? Create a new calendar, 
create a, all, all, create any new resources that you need, which you'd have to do anyway, but you don't have to start from scratch. You've got this structure, which is already provided for you, but it doesn't make it 100% clear where that is. It's in that manage sites piece, okay? Um, and then the other thing that I strongly recommend is, and I'll show you the, the managed sites. So, oh, I'm going to copy sites. Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. So if you go to the if you go to the site, you go up to the top. Yeah. Okay, and it gives you these options. Yeah. Then you go down here where it says yeah. manage site. Okay. Then you click on that, and it's within here. If you scroll down, there's copy this site. I know, it took me a while. I actually had to Google to find it. It's, it's a very arcane place to put that. It yeah. really is, it, and it's and the thing is they don't highlight it in any way. Like you'd think that you'd want to do this, but the whatever. The button about copy this over immediately is not. Yeah, and it's not sort of 100% clear what it is that you're doing. But um, but anyway, so yeah, so that's, that's one nice thing. Um, and I strongly recommend that you create a drive folder for each of these for each of your courses that's what I've done right so I go in here and it's hard to see I know but this is EST fall 17 EST 323 fall 17 EST 305 right these are the courses that I'm teaching and that AC basically says active right it's just my own little code for myself and because it's a and C it winds up at the top of the list when I sort it by name that's the whole thinking behind that. I make it even shorter. I remember with EST, I just, it's like 391F17. Well, I, I, I started doing that when I first arrived, and yes. I was also teaching a CS course. That's so, right. um, but yeah, so when you go into this folder, so EST305, I've got here are all of my presentations, right? Here are some of the weekly materials, like the attendance and the, that big O template. Um, and then here are sort of supporting documents, right? You can put in here whatever you want. I do encourage you to be organized about it, to follow some semblance of order in this, so that, that way it's easier for you to find things. And then the other nice thing about it is that I've now taught EST 305 three times, and I can go back very quickly and easily and find the presentation to use as the starting point for my next delivery of that class. Right? So I go to, I go back here to spring EST 305, and I say, oh, okay, well, I want to talk about design this week. And I just open, or I just make a copy and then move it into the right folder. Or I open it up and make a copy and move it into the correct folder. Um, you do have to do the copying manually. And that's tedious, I haven't found any way. Like, copying stuff in Drive should be easy. You should be able to copy a folder over and start with that. I haven't seen a way of doing it. I've been exploring, and I just haven't found any way of doing it. Um, sometimes it's a plus, sometimes it's a, just an annoyance. All right, um, so that pretty much covers this, but just as a brief recap on sites, um, the benefits are, the, the biggest benefit is that our students have access to it, and that Stony Brook provides it, which means that Stony Brook supports it. Now it's Google, so it's fairly stable. But the other thing is, because Google, because Stony Brook is, is providing it, you can call up Stony Brook Help and they will try to help you with it, which is not to be underrated. Um, <clears throat> Make sure you use, this is a, a big gotcha, make sure that you use the stonybrook.edu address, your stonybrook.edu address if you have one, um, when you're creating one of these sites in order to make sure that your students can actually access it. You can make any of these sites publicly available. If it's on studentkorea.ac.kr, you can make it publicly available. But if you don't want to make it publicly available, you can still make it available you can, you can invite people to a, a course manually or to, to one of these resources manually. That's kind of tedious. Yes? What about uh, Blackboard? Are you using Blackboard? Yeah, I'm going to get to some things right. that I use there in just one moment. I know we don't have a lot of time. but um, And then um, 
so these are basically the, the, the various benefits. I strongly recommend take a look at my teamwork contract. There's some fun little gotchas in there. Um, so now, what about Blackboard? Um, so let me just start off by saying I don't like Blackboard. <laughs> okay, um, and, and I'm not in any way trying to get people to like Blackboard. There are a lot of things that it, it offers some very nice features, but it also offers some things which are very difficult, right? And, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But there are two elements that I really like about Blackboard um, that, that I strongly recommend you consider. One is discussion boards, right? It allows for conversation to go on outside of the classroom, right? When you're not physically meeting and allows them to do some preparation, you know, for class and, and document some of that preparation for class. But the other nice thing about it is that you're not up on the stage, which means they're more likely to be conversing with each other if you structure it properly, right? Which means that you get the effects of peer-to-peer -peer learning, right? You get students actually working with each other to help each other understand um, what the content is actually all about. And that's really important. I, clearly, I'm coming from a, a collaboration background. Um, another piece is rubrics. I'll show you that. That's what I'm going to focus the next few minutes on. But, um, but the benefits of, of offering a rubric include transparency in grading, um, clarity in grading, and I know that that's similar, but they're not the same thing, right? And then it allows you to offer your students feedback, sort of structured and, um, and, and, and sufficient feedback, and it also even offers support for group submissions, which is a nice, is a bonus for me. Like it supports the groups function within, um, within Blackboard. So one of the elements, if you, or sorry, if you're gonna create a, a rubric, this is the, the side of Blackboard, because I don't wanna show my actual Blackboard instance because it has some you know, content that needs to be private. But um, if you go down here, and I know you, you have to look for it, but this is the course tools section, and then here it says rubrics. You might just have to trust me on that. <coughs> Excuse me. But then if you click on that, it brings you to a screen where you can create rubrics. I skipped that screen because it's fairly intuitive, but this is what one of those do, one of those rubrics looks like. And again, I strongly recommend that you investigate using these. And, and as Not Jung and, and Lila were commenting on before, this is my assignment. These are the assignments that I provide. I don't provide alternate instructions on what I'm looking for. This is it. This is how I'm grading you. So really, you shouldn't look for anything else. Because quite frankly, if it contradicts this, then it's a lie, because I'm not grading you on it. Right? This provides 100% clarity, because if it's not on here, I can't offer a grade on it, or I can't modify the grade on it. So what do I have in here? I have things like formatting, right? And then I have sort of bad, good, great. And I provide a description for each of those items, right? And bad, no slide deck provided. This was for a presentation. No slide deck provided. Um, formatting, uh, slide deck, for, you know, good slide deck provided, but some inconsistencies, some weird formatting issues or jarring, jumps from page to page, right? That's basically what this text provides. So it, there's no lack of clarity on the part of the student. They can evaluate their own work before they submit it and say, does this meet those criteria? Now, they're students, right? So naturally, they don't necessarily know all of it. That's why they're here. And so that's still gonna be a challenge, of course. But this provides as much clarity as I can provide because I then, flip this around, once I've done that, it also allows me to, to assign different point values to each piece of it, right, different weights to each piece of it. And I can, you know, this is, I usually set this as zero, 50%, and 100% for that category. And then, so here's the sort of the of description, which is what Lila was talking about earlier. Um, 
it would be nice to have all of that information that I have in the syllabus match what's up here. And I totally get that, but it's a lot of work. Um, then down here, you've got the actual, um, the criteria themselves. And you can put in as many as you want. Then, oh, well, this is, this is sort of more detail on what one of these looks like, right? Organization, appropriate attire, all team members dressed casually or inappropriately. That would be novice, right? Which gets you zero points. Then um, half of the team members are dressed appropriately for a business presentation, right? 50%. And in theory, I would have talked to you about what appropriate attire is in class, right? And then all team members are dressed appropriately for a business presentation or appropriately for the topic, right? This is specific to my courses. You do it however you want, but this allows them, they can then go in and see this and they know what it is that I am grading them on, exactly what I'm grading them on. Then you attach it to your assignment. And this is one of the big gotchas, okay? And I always get caught up on this, even though I know about it. This is another one of those beauties of, of Blackboard, right? Um, you attach, there's this add rubric, and you can attach it to a discussion board, you can attach it to a, an assignment, and I'm sure other elements as well. But then, <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm gone here, so. Oh, okay, I'll be out in a couple minutes. Well, it's two, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is the, the place where you have to watch out. The default option here is no, and the category is show rubric to students. I don't know why you would ever spend the time on developing a rubric and not show it to the students, but that is the default. What I always go with is yes, show it with the grading, right? Show it once they, once they have the, the grades, but it doesn't always, it, it always defaults, and so I always wind up with a, a few that um, that are not not appropriately done. So make sure that you actually make it available to your students so they can see it, and then when it comes time to grade, you click the one that is appropriate for that particular project. You you pull up the assignment, and you just go through and click. Did they format it properly? Did they organize things properly, right? And then you put in here any notes, a simple design, but whatever. And then they get to see all of this. All of this information goes right out to them. And the other nice thing is that it will calculate the score for you, right? So I just click through it. I don't have to be thinking, oh, this is an A student, a B student, anything like that. All I have to do is say what they've done, how the evaluation works out, and then it calculates that for you. But if in some cases that is incorrect or you want to add points or take, for whatever reason, you can actually modify that grade manually, right? So you still have full control. And then I often like to give some, some kind of high level feedback. So this way you get feedback on the individual item, but then you can also give high level feedback as well. And it's directly tied into what it is that they're doing. So, um, to recap very quickly, um, the, it's the system of record, the, there's some significant benefits to actually using Blackboard. Um, the drawbacks are the user interface is unintuitive and, and, and often cumbersome. Um, there's also, it's slow because we're reaching out to, um, to Stony Brook, right? So, so there's definitely some time delay. And then there's a big gotcha in when you set the when you set the uh, times for due dates, time zone issues, because again, it's set for Stony Brook. And that's enough for us for today. Thank you, Dr. Modell. If there's any questions, we'll take it in the lobby outside, but thank you very much. Yeah.